Hi all, Brian Tillis has kindly sent me one of the great game inspirations for his use of the Alakine defense, and it's a game of Hikaru Nakamura played in the highly competitive round five of Las Vegas 2007 tournament. So that had big prize money at stake. Now, um, Brian Tillis has a fantastic book currently rated 4.89 out of 5. The Dark Knight Rises. Uh, you might want to check that out. Here is the um, short URL for that. If you want to check that out, it's currently on special offer. Let's have a look at this fantastic game example, which was an influence for him to have a great interest in the Anakine defense. So Todd Andrews playing white against Nakamura. So back in 2007, E4, we have knight F6. So provocation, E5. Knight d5, d4, d6. E takes d6. You'll note that now, if black fianchettos the bishop, that this d4 pawn could be under fire later. C takes, c4, knight b6. Slight downside, the knights travelled to the queen side, maybe the king side's a bit weaker in some variations, subject to a more direct hack attack. Knight c3, g6. Black gets ready to start putting pressure on d4. Bishop e3, bishop g7, rook c1. So white has been very careful so far not to allow knight f3, bishop g4, which would seem quite natural for black to pin that knight, potentially take out the knight and put more pressure on e5. We see black castling, b3. And now bishop f5, which is in Brian Tennis's book considered the main line, trying to kind of trick white into playing knight f3 as though there's no way this bishop's going to move again surely if knight f3 happens uh, on knight c6 knight f3 bishop g4 for example this position black with d5 restraining the d4 pawn and provoking c5 this knight can stumble back but re-centralize with a vengeance and the dark knight literally rises here in this line well this this particular knight rises up again to pressurize d4 you can see it coming back to the center with a big advantage an ideal position great firepower on d4 why it's really tied down there so bishop f5 but now white did play knight f3 perhaps better is to avoid it uh, one way bishop e2 but black can still play d5, provoke c5, this knight can come out to c8. And now here, very, very sharp idea, which is analyzed in the book, e5 in great detail. Just one glimpse of what's happening here after e5, because it looks as though d5 is a major issue. On d takes, there's actually knight c6, where black's counterattacking on the e5 pawn. The king's still in the center, so this is actually there's actually some problems here. For example, this position uh, is going to be problematic after knight e7. If white castles, then knight takes f3 check and taking on d5. And on taking here, uh, if white has these double pawns, this is looking horrendous for white. Black's getting a big advantage there. That structural damage is huge. Uh, so very interesting idea after bishop e2 exists. And instead, if uh, g4, that move 10, Perhaps uh, even bishop c8 is uh, is good to keep d7 vacant sometimes. So if white tries for a hack attack to exploit the knight over here, black can play d5 here, use d7. Doesn't matter about d5 dropping because there's a huge counterattack on the dark squares about to happen here. So this kind of thing, bang, bishop takes g4 as well. Black's fine. So knight f3, though, in the game was played. Bishop g4. So is this waste of tempo justified? Now, we see also from Leela games, she's often giving up a bishop to put pressure on the other color complex of the bishop. So here, giving up a light square bishop to try and celebrate the dark squares. Is it worth it here? Bishop e2. Nakamura plays this, not just a waiting move, it's a dual purpose move. Not just waiting for h3, but also being able to fix the d4 pawn down by playing d5 and vote c5. 
for this knight to come back with a vengeance. So uh, white castles. Uh, if d5 was played here, then e takes, knight takes. Black should be fine. That c6 square is a nice square for the knight to come immediately, for example. Black should be uh, fairly okay here. With d5 break, should at least be equal. So white castles. D5 now provoking this C5. Is this knight going to come back with a vengeance? This one in particular. B4. We have now voluntarily giving up the light square bishop. So will there be, as we've seen for many Leela chess games in the neural network, a dark square celebration from this position? Uh, if um, knight C6 instead, then maybe B5. This position uh, is um, is also of some interest to black. It's not that bad, but bishop takes f3 immediately was played. Uh, now a6, a4. So this tries to guarantee an active rook when b5 is played to be able to take and have an active rook, which in some variations can actually be useful. Knight c6, b5. In fact, the pawn wasn't taken here. Knight a5. So we have a knight on the rim and a knight on c8. Is this crazy stuff or what? Rook e1. And the fascinating thing here is h6, a safeguarding this knight's journey to potentially f5 without the potential of a pin. If knight e7 was played immediately, then this pin is pretty annoying. Black never wants to play really f6 in general. That would weaken e6 and, and the diagonal. And if white you know, snaps off that uh, knight, white's light square play, corresponding light square play, and protection on the dark square as well is increased. So I actually have a small edge there because the queen side expansion is also quite meaningful now. Uh, so anyway, h6 safeguards this knight's journey, recentralization journey, to hit that d4 really hard. So we see bishop f4, knight e7. And white tries to cut through black's plans. Bishop e5, trying to weaken and punish this h6, perhaps trying to create, emphasize this vacuum of dark square weaknesses. Nakamura takes on e5. Rook takes e5 is played. If d takes, then rook c8, that c5 is hit hard. And in fact, it's difficult to actually kind of constructively do something here. Uh, because there's things like knight c4 coming if knight a2, for example, potentially. If that c5 is given up for just a6, uh, there's a lot of pressure on c3 there. Then black is getting a re remarkably solid position, really nice position, with e5 still being vulnerable. Black is just better here, positionally. So uh, we have rook takes e5, not weakening c5, as that variation showed. But knight f5 now. Bishop e2. Here, if rook e1, uh, queen f6, and look, the queen joining on this diagonal, replacing the role of that bishop, hitting d4 hard. And of course, if something like queen d2, there's knight b3, this knight's ready to pounce as well into b3 if needed, if the queen wasn't guarding b3. If knight e2, fascinatingly, the, this rook can sometimes get involved in the battle against d4 for example knight c4 say g3 rook a2 and you can see actually there's a huge threat of rook d2 here so for example this is a disaster rook d2 and then taking here is a disaster but also in this line if rook c2 there then can you see what black plays if i give you five seconds to pause the video Okay, black has the juicy knight f e3. And this is wonderful stuff. Taking on f3. It's possible threatening chatmate, hitting the rook still. If knight f4, rook takes c2. And black's just absolutely winning here, the exchange up. So uh, here, uh, bishop e2 was played. We have a takes, a takes queen f6. And now there's a not so the subtle ideas or not so subtle of playing knight takes d4, queen takes a knight b3, which would hit the rook, leave this one pinned, it would be a total disaster. So white tries to reinforce the e5 rook here with f4 and keep a barricade against d4. But guess what Nakamura plays? 
in this position if I give you five seconds to pause the video. Okay, bang, dark square celebration indeed. Knight takes d4. We have queen takes d4, knight b3, and there's only really one square to protect the rook, and that runs into d4, knight e4, and so because otherwise c1 drops, but now queen takes e5. Now white tries to be resourceful with queen f3, so the queen hasn't got too many squares. Well, at the moment, it actually goes into a place it hasn't got too many squares, uh, rather, uh, with queen f5. And now white plays g4, trapping Nakamura's queen. If rook d1 here, then knight takes c5. So that's one of the points as well, to keep the pressure on c5, hitting e4 now. So this is obviously the exchange up for black with a huge advantage. So Nakamura doesn't mind, invites this trapping of the queen with g4 and takes off the knight and the rook now, threatening uh, if queen takes, there's knight takes e2, so the bishop moves. But now d3, we have queen e3. Rook f d8, not minding the knight being taken. White plays queen d2. If queen takes c1, then d2. And here, rook a1 crushes, getting the queen off the blockade, queening the pawn. So uh, queen d2, rook a4, bishop takes d3, knight takes d3, c6, rook a1 check, and the game ended here. The queen is being lost. For example, king g1, knight e1 check, discovering that attack, and it's too late for the white pawns. The white pawns are not doing anything here. So, crushing. So, rook a1 check, game ending there. So, yes, that would have made a big impression on me to have witnessed this game uh, of Nakamura. So, this is part of the inspiration and motivation for this fantastic book at Chessable. Let's have a look at that. If you want to explore a lot of variations, The Dark Knight Rises, some critical lines of this game are also in the book. So an excellent book by Brian Tillis and Roman Disvish <laughs> Roman Zinzi, <laughs> visually. Okay. But Brian Tillis as well is the major driver of this fantastic resource on special offer at the moment, if you want to check that out. Okay. Wonderful stuff. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks very much.